So good morning everyone and our great fortune this morning we have Dan and Dan's from our Australian headquarters in Five Dock and uh, he's got a very interesting topic and that is our blind spots. So things that we don't know about ourselves and others can see but we can't so I'm very interested to hear about this, something we could learn a lot from. So thank you very much, Dan, and uh, we'll speak to you later after you've mm -hmm. finished. Thank you, Sally. So Om Shanti, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Sally, for the sweet introduction. And, uh, yeah, I was looking forward to sharing with you all to raise more awareness around our blind spots. The, the analogy for this topic is you know, if you're driving your car and we all know that when we learn to drive, we get taught that we have to not only check in our side mirror before changing lanes or overtaking, but we also have to turn over our shoulder because if you only check that side mirror, actually if a car is just on your shoulder, it won't be visible in the side mirror so that's a blind spot and you know car mirrors used to have that little sticker on them to tell you about that blind spot um, so that you knew to also check over your shoulder and in the same way we have to also think about are there blind spots with our third eye our insight into ourselves as to how we work as a person um, because the physical eyes have blind spots with the physical world but what are the blind spots in my consciousness, blind spots in my self-awareness? And this will become clearer as we go through the talk, but to begin with, I wanted to start with a gentle meditation. Uh, one of our basic understandings actually is that if I meditate a little bit before I listen to a spiritual talk, it puts me into a mental space where I can really pick up and absorb and reflect personally on the concepts which are being discussed rather than just keeping content as a theoretical or intellectual thing, the meditation helps me um, take it inside or think about it in a more self-reflective way. So I was going to just do a three or four minute commentary to get us into that more spiritual, soul conscious space. So to start with, just become aware of your own breath. And start to take in more and more deeply the breath down into your diaphragm. And we want to move into observer state where 
things are happening around me. I'm aware of what's going on. But I pick up this thought that I'm just an observer of everything. I, the conscious being, and listening to this through my ears. I'm not the ears. I'm the one inside listening. That one that's got cognitive ability. That one who's thinking and listening. If my, if my eyes are open, I'm aware that they're like windows. I'm the one who's looking out into this material world through these windows. I'm not the eyes. I'm the one looking out through these eyes. So I'm also observing my breath and bringing it in more deeply. So the being of consciousness, the one who has awareness, resides in this physical body. And I just am aware of and observe what's happening around me externally. But then I want to move my attention from the external, from the breath, from the body to my own thoughts, what's happening inside me. I'm also not my thoughts. I'm not the feelings that may be present inside me. I'm the witness, the observer of my inner world. first step to learning is just to be able to watch and observe. In society, we tend to learn about ourselves through the observations that others make of us. And we find it insightful when someone close to us shares their observation. Oh, I didn't see that in myself. But when we meditate, we really start to learn who we are through close observation of ourselves. We're not dependent on someone else to validate us, to inform us who we are. We develop a new sense of self-respect as the observer and the learner about myself. As I go inside, I imagine, I visualize a tiny star of light energy. And as I visualize this point of light, I imagine that it's shining peace and light into my mind's eye. It's like an energy that I can absorb inside myself. I am this peace. I am this feeling of lightness. This peace is my original nature. Om Shanti. So, hopefully that's made you feel more relaxed and at peace. Our greeting, Om Shanti, just means I am peaceful. I am a being of peace. And we want to um, reach a state where I am moving in that consciousness. My peace is so deep that it's in my voice, it's in my vibration, it's in my attitude. Um, the world moves around me, but I stay in my peace inside. Now, as we were 
sharing earlier about the topic to do with spiritual awareness and to do with our blind spots. And we had the analogy of driving the car. And so my life is like the car and I am the driver of my life. But do I see myself clearly? How well have I observed myself and been the witness of who I am? How much do I remain dependent on others to try and tell me who I am? Um, and how much do I miss um, who I am? Because there's a block inside. And, you know, one of the reasons in spiritual literature we talk about the third eye is that as we start to meditate, it's like my attention shifts to the internal world. Um, conscious or not, that attention for most people has been glued to their senses, glued to the senses which perceive information about the world externally. And uh, for some people, they may have no attention at all as to what's happening inside into the inner world. And that was the case for me. And when I started to meditate, it was like a new world opened up because all of a sudden, I'm starting to bring my attention to what's happening inside, stopping physical activity, not even doing anything, and just meditating. And I become aware of my thoughts, my feelings, what's happening inside. And then I start to even take that into a deeper level, which is that how do I see what happens around me triggering different experiences inside, and then seeing that I'm really responsible for my inside world. And the people around me, the situations around me, are actually just triggers to teach me more about myself so that I can continue to learn, observe, witness, and build really a deep understanding of who I am, really knowing myself well. And then part of that journey is that we also start to learn or become aware of our blind spots. Um, Perhaps we already knew some of them. Perhaps we already had feedback from people around us about some of them. But also, as we observe ourselves, we can start to become aware of gaps that, oh, you know, how did that happen? Why did that thing go wrong? Um, you know, it's often going to be showing us that there was a blind spot operating, that there was something I missed inside myself that led to a collision of personalities or lead to a wrong judgment or an assessment of a situation that I made. So what are these blind spots? And you may already know, but even our physical eye, actually, it has an inherent blind spot in it. The, the back of the eyeball, there is the optic nerve, where the information from the eye feeds into the brain. And where the optic nerve um, joins into the eye, there is no light receptors. So the eyeball has rods and cones which pick up the light that comes into the eye. But where the optic nerve is there, there are no rods or cones. There's no light receptors. So what your brain does, you may know this, but your brain actually fills two small gaps in your visual field, roughly where my fingers are indicating. All human beings are blind. Two tiny dots are there where the optic nerve can't actually... Um, pick up light because the join itself physically blocks light. But your brain is so clever that it creates that data in your visual field so you don't see two black holes here. You see a room, I'm seeing a room now where it looks normal. Um, so how amazing is the brain? If you want to do a test, you can look on YouTube and Google that test. There's a test you can do with a, putting a dot on a piece of paper where you hold it out and adjust it until that dot disappears on the piece of paper. Because once you're holding that dot in your blind spot, you catch the point where your brain washes the dot away and just turns it into a white piece of paper. Um, because that's the spot where your brain is actually creating the data from the surrounding context, which is white paper, so it clears the dot. Um, so try it out if you don't believe it. And then the same thing is actually true of our personality, um, we have blind spots and we smooth out the data from the context to conceal the information. And sometimes we do that because maybe we've been hurt, maybe it makes us feel vulnerable, um, maybe we've got like a chip on our shoulder from some experience in our childhood or growing up. 
And that's like a blind spot. And it clouds our judgment, our ability to see the world as it is, is clouded by that one thing that we're carrying. And sometimes it's not until we're ready to actually look at it or let go of it that we start to see it. And so meditation is a tool to help us expand our consciousness, to grow spiritually. And one aspect of expanding our awareness is that it's as if the inner light that the soul is shines out more and more. And all of a sudden it starts to throw a bit of light onto a shadow that we're carrying. And that thing starts to come out a little bit more in our life because it wants to heal. And actually the word meditation comes from this word mandiri in Latin meaning to heal. It's a journey where we actually we want to heal. So as those things come more into the light of our own self-awareness expanding, they all start to feature in our life. And one of the best tools or mirrors for becoming aware of our blind spots is the people in our environment because they give us feedback as to mistakes that we make or things that aren't right. And we can use that feedback if we are humble and have self-respect and listen to what people are saying and go, mm, you know, maybe there's something I'm not seeing. Um, but the first blind spot I wanted to talk about is if for some people there may even be a resistance that I don't have any blind spots. That's what other people have got, but I don't have any. So I think that's blind spot number one. Everyone has one or another blind spot. There are no perfect uh, human beings in this world that are free from blind spots. So if our mind isn't even open to it, I would encourage that people really need to challenge themselves there and say, mm, am I really so confident that I don't have any blind spots? Or is that in itself like a protection mechanism that I'm scared to even think about it? Um, I would suggest that is the reason we're scared to think about it because we do have blind spots. And how do we grow if we don't look at them and think about how we can change ourselves? And sometimes even just becoming aware of it, that's like 50% of the work. Um, the thing to change it, it's not as bad as we think. Um, we may skirt around it or hide from something inside, but once we become aware of it, we really do want to change it, and it's not that big a deal. So the first blind spot, thinking I have none. The second blind spot, and I'm sure you'll relate to this one, at least we all know people, we can't self-identify with it, but when we think that we're always right. And this one's a very slippery blind spot because, you know, we're not idiots. We do things because we've assessed a situation and we believe that our assessment is correct. We don't, we don't act thinking, oh, I've got something wrong, but I'm going to do it and it's wrong because I love doing wrong things because I'm a dope. Uh, no, we think we're right. Of course we do. But it's when that sense of rightness becomes ego that it becomes a blind spot. Um, I think I'm right, but there's no humility in that. So I'm right and all of you are wrong. Uh, I'm right and my ideas are better than your ideas. Uh, I'm right, you need to listen to me. When it has that sort of demanding edge to it, um, then I know that my ego has sort of hijacked my sense of rightness. It's not wrong to be right in the sense that of course, we want to implement things which seem like really good ideas. But does arrogance creep in and make my sense of being right um, a blind spot? Why wouldn't someone else also be right? Am I listening to their ideas? Uh, if I'm not listening to other people's ideas, if that's a problem, a feedback that I'm getting from other people, then probably this blind spot is there. Uh, another evidence of this blind spot is where I need to prove myself right. You know, I can't just listen to something that someone else says, know that it's wrong, and just let it go. No, I have to really, you know, point on that. You're wrong, and this is why you're wrong. I send them an email one day later, two days later, or I ring them, or I'm talking to other people about it. Why am I like that? What's the need to prove it? You know, what's inside me that's so concerned about that? It's my own sense of rightness, perhaps. So that's another possible indicator that I'm having that ego, that blind spot. I have to prove myself right. Because actually, truth and that humble rightness, there's nothing to prove. Um, 
truth always proves itself over time anyway. And if we go in really defensive, um, become defensive about being right, it tends to give people the impression actually that we're being stubborn or that we're not really being honest. So if I've got that humility, actually I'm more likely to have a longer term view and get a better outcome anyway. So that's one uh, second blind spot. The third blind spot is another slippery one, um, also connected to ego, that false sense of self that I think all of us carry in body consciousness, where I think on my role, on my body, on my position, on all the relationships and things and possessions that I have. And so connected to this is the blind spot of what we often call colloquially the know-it-all. Um, you have something you may share with someone and before you've even finished sharing, yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah, I already know that. Um, they haven't even heard you. They haven't even listened, but they already know. So this is a dangerous one because the more we get into thinking we already know, um, we can't learn anymore, you know. And for me, spiritually, on a life where we're trying to expand our consciousness, it's a life of learning for our whole life. There is never an end and there is never a point in which I've already learned it all. Unfortunately, the more we learn, if we're humble, the more we realize that we don't know. You know, part of learning is understanding just how little we know, um, not only ourselves, but others also. So we need that humility in our learning to keep growing. And actually, it's like a protection mechanism to think that I already know you know maybe as a child growing up in school if we didn't know something we got shamed by our teacher or maybe we felt disapproval from our parents so we picked up this camouflaging technique that you know, no whatever happens just pretend that you already know everything or it's a sign of weakness that people are going to think that I'm dumb because I asked a stupid question and revealed that I didn't know something so we go on just yeah I already know stuff but then we need to try and look inside and change that we may be aware of the origin of it we may not be um, but to keep learning and growing on a spiritual path I really need to let go of thinking I know everything um, I don't I have a lot to learn and the people around me even if they're younger than me even if they're less experienced than me definitely they can be my teachers because I need to learn about myself. And you never know who is the person who's going to become that mirror in your life to teach you about yourself. Um, it's not necessarily going to be some wise sage who becomes the one who teaches you about yourself. Actually, with someone who's much older, um, more mature and more experienced, you might feel it easier to be humble and listen. Um, but it might be the young person in your office who knows less than you that gets up your nose that's really going to teach you what your ego is. Uh, unfortunately, it's often like that, right? So that's a third blind spot I already know. The fourth blind spot I want to share about is the blind spot where we become the judge for other people and the lawyer for ourselves. And from a spiritual path, what we actually want to do is become a judge for ourselves and a lawyer for others. Now, what I mean by judge and lawyer is the sense in which, you know, as a judge, I'm discerning and um, I'm very impartial in making a fair and honest assessment about something. So for myself, I'm aware of what's going on. I, I judge accurately, honestly with myself. But for others, the lawyer is you know where you build a case and you're a bit more compassionate and you allow a few excuses in and because there can be a more merciful uh, attitude where there can be some what well, sometimes I love this expression it can be generous assumptions about others um, rather than assuming the worst about others and so I'm like the judgmental judge that I'm trying to kind of like give them the law read them the right act how can they do that um, so for example, to try and make it concrete, say someone is late for something, you know. Now, maybe I myself am always late or very regularly late. And when I do it, it's like, oh, no, but because of this reason, how could I? I'm, I'm so important and 
this happened, I had to meet that person, the traffic, whatever. For myself, big list of excuses. I make a really nice case. If someone questions me, here's my case, the reason why I'm late, completely justified. Someone else is late, how can they do that? They shouldn't be late. I don't even ask. I don't even inquire as to what the reason might be. So why would that be, right? At least I should find out if it's appropriate for me to even find out because it may not even be my business, right? But if, it's, if it is for some reason my business in this example, then I need to inquire. And I can inquire in a way that reveals a generous assumption about what's happening in someone's life. Uh, for example, oh, yeah, you know, you've got a new baby in the house. So, you know, are you sleeping okay at home? What's the situation? You know, whatever it might be, I can think of ways to make a generous assumption um, rather than stingy assumptions, you know, where I assume, oh, yeah, this person's always late because they're useless. They're really lazy. They've got no time management or whatever may be the case. Because if I reveal that type of attitude towards someone, actually I'm more likely to bring out or feed, support their weakness. Whereas if you have a generous assumption towards someone, they feel like, oh, how nice. They, they're thinking in such a good way towards me. And they're more likely to feel like, I really want to be on time um, because such and such a person is thinking in such a nice way about, about me. I don't want to let them down, you know, because people want to move into that nice attitude that someone has towards them. Um, so when we become the lawyer for others, we build a nice scenario for them and we remain honest with ourselves and we try not to let ourselves become full of excuses uh, because we can deceive ourselves with our excuses. I know I can definitely do it. That, you know, such lame excuses that we can accept for ourselves when really we know that we just needed to kind of pull our socks up and make a bit more effort or not do something, be a bit more disciplined about something. So still being aware, just because I make generous assumptions about others doesn't mean that I'm an idiot. Um, actually, I, I see things just as 2020 vision as I did before, but I consciously choose to preference a certain attitude in the way I interact with people that's going to try and bring about a better result for them and a better result for my own character as well. So I feel it's a common blind spot when... Um, I am by default stuck in judging others and being a lawyer for myself. And the key revelation or revealing point is where um, my expectation of my own conduct is not matching the expectation I have on others. You know, So I think others should have such a high standard of behavior, but for myself, there's like no standard required whatsoever. You know, it's not fair, right? So people will say to us, but you know, for that person you're demanding they should be like this, this, and this, but you don't practice it in your own life. Isn't that hypocritical? This is when I've become the judge for others and the lawyer for myself. There's a hypocritical double standard that's operating. And people over time, they really, you know, you won't get respect from people's hearts. And we're like that. Really, people respect integrity. Um, and when there isn't that kind of double standard, that whatever I'm thinking about others, I really try and practice myself first um, and set the example for that. And that's, in a sense, what a spiritual life is about and also what being self-aware is about. I'm aware that I'm setting the example of the sort of behavior or conduct that I think is good for other people as well. Um, not just being like the nasty boss or nasty manager who demands everything from everyone else um, but doesn't behave like that themselves. So that's the fourth blind spot. And the fifth and last blind spot that I was going to share about today is the blind spot about prejudice and labels. So we often uh, have a hard wiring in the same way that we talked earlier about the brain having a hard wiring. There's a spiritual hard wiring to make judgments about other people um, based on what presents externally in terms of the body and labels. It's completely scientifically proven, psychologically researched. Um, like it or not, you do it, I do it. Um, if you want to watch something on YouTube, there's a really cool um, thought experiment. It was actually a Coca-Cola ad for Ramadan. 
So if you type into Google um, Ramadan Coca-Cola ad, um, they have this two, three minute video. They got uh, a group of people in a room together. Maybe there were eight people. They intentionally chose people whose external physical appearance didn't match the stereotypical cultural story that you would expect from them. So they had a guy who was paraplegic who was into um, parachuting. They had a, a Muslim guy. I think he had lots of tattoos and liked heavy metal music, and he was Muslim. And then they had a, a Muslim guy who was wearing the full Muslim gear who um, liked cooking or something like that. You'll see if you watch it from memory, they don't, chose those sorts of scenarios that didn't match. And then they were in a room with the lights off and the lights came up at the end and they saw the people that they were interacting with for the first time. And you could feel the surprise and exclamation in their faces because what had built up as a picture in their mind's eye, in their spiritual eye, didn't match what they physically saw. And it was beautiful because it reveals how um, inside we are building images of each other based on assumptions, based on experience, based on the TV that we've watched too much of, and they may not match. And um, they said in the beginning of that ad that I think in six or seven seconds, that's how long it takes us to make our assessment of someone else based on superficial external factors. Six or seven seconds. So this is a huge blind spot. And the way we try and correct this blind spot in Raj Yoga isn't to remove prejudice. Actually, prejudice is a good thing. And I'm saying that partly to stir you up because you think, what? How can prejudice be a good thing? But actually, it's a faculty of consciousness to be able to hold an awareness towards someone. Um, the problem is that we've misused it and we've loaded ourselves up with negative awareness towards people and body conscious judgments. But you can use the same faculty to become positively prejudiced towards everyone. So, for example, um, whatever someone may present like now, we know that they were once an innocent child. They've got a family environment. They want to be loved, respected, cared for like any other human being. So why am I seeing other aspects of them and giving my attention to that? Because I'm, I'm moving towards negative prejudice rather than my positive prejudice. So I want to have in myself, this is my personal aim, positive soul conscious prejudice towards everyone um, that I assume the best and I work to bring out the best in everyone. And Sally, who you heard from earlier, is a wonderful example of this. She's very prejudiced. Because she really just, in a loving, motherly way, sees the best in everyone. And, you know, she brings out a different character in people that only she can bring out. Because she has that attention on what's good in them and makes what's good in them more alive. Um, and it teaches all of us, through her example, the power of positive prejudice. That I can reprogram myself to find good in people and see their spiritual side. What is their loving nature, their peaceful nature, their harmony, their power of cooperation? All those subtle spiritual things, everyone's got different value. And we're not clones, we're all unique, but we all have different strengths. And no one is without some good quality and some good strengths. You know. So my work is to find the good strengths in people. As a spiritual person, that's the homework or the job that I always give myself. I really just need to work on finding what is their goodness. And, you know, what is the value in working so hard to find what's wrong with people? Why, why would I do that? What am I trying to prove? You know, we really have to question ourselves. Like, because it's very common, right? The, the typical gossip is really like a group research into why someone else sucks, what's wrong with them why they're a bugger, but, you know, actually that's revealing something about me if that's my focus on other people. You know, what do I gain from that? And actually, the thing that I'm complaining about in those type of interactions, by having those interactions, I'm empowering it in them. I'm bringing it out more. I may even be trying to colour other people to see them in that way. 
so that it becomes even more of an expanded reality in other people's minds as well. Yeah. If I'm loving and merciful and I know someone's got a weakness or made a mistake, actually, why would I want to tell everyone else about that? Is that going to help them change? Or is it because I want to show myself to be so good that I've got that problem? It's going to reveal something about me, not about them. Help them change in a positive direction by being supportive if people have made a mistake. Don't push them and kick them while they're down. You know, if someone does that in a physical fight, people will be like, yeah, that's terrible. How could you kick someone while they're down? But spiritually, people do it a lot. So we should have that same type of awareness. No, you don't kick people when they're down. They're my brother. They're my sister. How can I support them? My good feelings, my positive attitude can support people. So let me help bring them up. Now, this is a high aim, and um, we shouldn't feel bad seeing a high aim, but we should think, yeah, that's a really cool aim, and I can think about it more. Maybe I don't want to go that far in my life, but really it's worth thinking about, I would encourage. So these are the blind spots for today, and I hope you found it useful to tune into this. And now we're going to have a meditation. I've lined up a meditation commentary. I am going to sit here and meditate with you and we'll enjoy that commentary. So Om Shanti, thank you. Have a fantastic day. And let's have some meditation together. comfortable and allow your body to relax. Check whether you're holding on to tightness or stress in any part of your body. And let go wherever you notice you're holding on. Start at your toes. Check for any tension in your feet, in your legs and hips. Let go more and more as you check for tightness in your stomach area. Let go wherever you're holding tension in your back. Let go any tension in your arms and your hands. Open your hands. Uncurl your fingers. Relax your neck. Loosen your shoulders, let them go. Muscles at rest. Unclench your jaw. Relax your forehead. Relax all the muscles of your face. Relax. Good. Now that your body is a little more relaxed, pay attention to your breathing. Begin to breathe more deeply. Breathe in deeply and then breathe out fully. Breathe at a pace that's calming for you. Feel your emotions settling 
each time you breathe out. Feel more connected to your inner peace. Keep breathing as I remind you what you already know. Your thoughts create your state of mind. What you think affects the way you feel and the way you experience life. Keep breathing deeply. Anxious thoughts make you feel anxious and overwhelmed. Calm thoughts make you feel calm and in control. Here are some calm thoughts to focus on. Keep breathing deeply as you say these calm thoughts in your mind. Everything's going to be okay. I'm regaining control over my thoughts. I am restoring calmness to my mind. I choose positive thoughts. Keep breathing deeply and say these calm thoughts in your mind. Inner peace is at the heart of me. I am peaceful. I am free. Inner peace is at the heart of me. Keep breathing deeply. And each time you breathe out now, have the feeling that you're releasing negative emotions, getting them out of your system. Breathing out negative emotions with each breath out. And as you breathe out now, have the sense that you're breathing out the storm of negative thoughts, getting them out of your head. With each breath out, the storm clouds that were in your head are disappearing into thin air.
let go any thought that doesn't help you. Let go any thought that doesn't empower you. Let go and be free. Choose to think uplifting thoughts. Thoughts that make you feel stronger. Everything's going to be okay. My mind is calm. I am free. Thank you very much, Dan. It was beautiful. So I've learned a lot from that, things that I didn't know about blind spots. And uh, it, it's very, very helpful. Um, I think a lot about that, Dan. And uh, Dan is a great example because he <coughs> treats everyone the same whether it's a little child or a very wise old person or whoever it is, he gives them the love and the interest in what they're saying, what they're doing, and just such a good example of that generosity of approach to life. So thank you very much and all the best for Five Doc. And uh, we'll see you again come another time and give us another talk. Share with us your thoughts. And uh, everyone, have a lovely day today. And we'll see you again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Bye. Mm -hmm.